Welcome to our Mary Greeley Primetime Alive presentation, Importance of Posture with Aging. I am Danielle Linder, stepping in for Vicki Newell, who is the manager of Primetime Alive. As a reminder, if you would like more information about Primetime Alive or how to join, please visit our website, mgmc.org backslash PTA. Our presenter today is Ann Hilleman. Ann has worked at Mary Greeley for 22 years. She graduated with her doctorate in physical therapy from Washington University in St. Louis and has her undergrad in exercise science from Wartburg. Please welcome Anne. Okay, we'll see if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, all right. Yes, I'm Anne. I have been here for a long, long time. Um, it's kind of crazy how fast time flies. <laughs> Keeps going faster all the time. It's really nice to see all of you guys here. It's been quite a while since I've presented to prime time, and it's nice to kind of see people in person again. So, okay, we'll see if I can remember how to do this. Okay, so today we're talking about posture. So, you know, might be looking around the room and seeing... <laughs> who's slouching and who's, yep, sitting up real tall now suddenly, yep, <laughs> yeah. And there'll be points awarded at the end for those who sat up straight the entire time. No, just kidding, just kidding. Although I will say in PT school, we some days we had lecture classes like eight hours a day and certain teachers would take points off if we were slouching and I think that first month I thought I was not gonna make it. <laughs> One, for sitting in class that long, and two, just it's hard work, but once you get used to it, it almost hurts me now to like slump, so it can be done. All right, posture. Uh, it, it encompasses a lot of things. What is it? Um, it's, an, it's an indicator for kind of assessing health and quality of life, especially for people who are a little bit older. Uh, we do see a lot of differences between men and women, um, especially neck, mid-thorax, or your mid-spine, and your hip. Um, the skeletons of men and women are very different, and it does affect your, your posture. Uh, men generally have taller pelvises. Women's are a little bit more round, um, and women tend to have a little bit wider angle from their hip to their knee. So some of those changes definitely affect how men and women change with posture throughout their life. So I always think it's good to kind of define what we're, what we're looking at so we kind of know what, what the gold standard is or what we're looking at. So posture is really just looking at your body parts in relationship to each other. So head over shoulders, shoulders over your hips, and then how does your trunk control your knees and ankles and so forth. This can be in static where you're just standing or sitting where you're not moving. And it can also be dynamic when you're running, walking, biking, all those kinds of postures. And keeping this control is something many of us don't think about until you suddenly have a balance problem. Um, but postural changes can, you know, which one came first? Did the postural change come and cause balance problems or vice versa? Sometimes we don't know. Um, but it's very important for being safe in your environment. So I don't know if many of you think about your posture that much, but um, I have a lot of patients who are like suddenly realizing, man, my posture is really bad and I don't, I don't know what to do to get out of this. So hopefully we can stop it before you're at that point of, I don't know how to return back to normal posture. So aging, I mean, we're all aging from day one. Um, everyone ages differently, but aging definitely modifies how your posture is aligned, how you align with your body. So we often see the flex forward posture way more than most other postures. Um, we're fighting gravity all the time and sometimes gravity kind of wins. Um, so we see people start to stoop and then a little bit more and a little bit more. And, you know, I've, I've had some patients who are almost bent in half because um, gravity is definitely winning. So when we have these flex postures, uh, we start to see rounding in the upper back, which we call like hyperkyphosis. You start to get that forward head position. 
uh, your lordotic curve, which is your your low back or your lumbar spine, can really be exaggerated. Uh, we see rounded shoulders. We also see that in kids too, but um, and flex tips and knees. So the more you flex forward, it starts to wreak havoc on not just one body part. And I like this uh, picture. Well, I don't like it, but <laughs> um, it shows how significant it can progress. Um, you know, if that's a pretty good body alignment in the first picture, and then you start to see a little bit more of that curve in that low lumbar spine, low spine, starting to get a little bit more of a forward head, where we, we really like the ear in line with your shoulder is kind of what we think of as normal. Well, it's starting to get a little bit forward. And then you can see, as you get to that fifth picture, it's kind of what we call a crouched gait. Um, you know, you've lost how many inches, and it's going to affect a lot of areas of your life. So we really do not want to see you coming in at picture number five. Why don't you come in at number two so we can help you? <laughs> so what causes these changes? Uh, there's a lot of things that cause these changes. You know, we're all very different. There's so many variables. Sometimes it's very clear, and sometimes it's a whole host of things. But some of those things that we see, um, we see vertebral compression fractures. So as we age, we start to see some people get osteopenia, which it then can lead into osteoporosis, which is decreased bone density. Um, I, I'm pretty sure there's pretty significant evidence that after age 30, our bone mass starts to decrease, which I don't understand why it happens so early. But um, we really need to try to keep our bones as strong as possible. And we'll talk about that a little bit further as well. But um, once you start getting compression fractures, your spine is not near as tall as it was. Like our vertebrae are stacked on each other. Well, they start to shrink down. That's going to lead to issues. Your spinal extensor muscles get weak, which they're all the ones I call the posterior chain or back here. Um, I liken it to kind of like reins on a horse, like they're holding, you're holding the horse up. Well, if those reins start to not be taut or held up, guess what happens? You start to lose control. Um, so we, we tend to not strengthen our posterior chain as much as we should. You start to lose range of motion. You lose flexibility, uh, especially the spine. Like we like to see spines nice and springy. Um, like if we assess a spine, it should kind of pop back into our hand. A lot of times it starts to get kind of stiff. Uh, I'll have a lot of times patients come in and they're like, oh, I didn't realize I couldn't, you know, I can't get all the way up straight anymore. Um, and it just kind of happens. You don't realize it happens till something significant. Sometimes we just have degenerative changes in tendons, ligaments, uh, the intervertebral disc, the discs between your vertebrae are supposed to be nice and spongy, full of water. Again, as we age, they don't absorb as much water, so they start to get shrunken down, which then leads to bones being closer than they should, um, which also causes pain. Um, and we have may cause pain. I would say lots of times it definitely causes pain. Uh, be because of these changes, the excess stretch, stretching, things like that. So it, it's, it can be very painful. Here we're talking a little bit more about those aging bones. Uh, so why do people get osteoporosis? Again, there's certain characteristics that predispose people more than others. But if you're not doing a lot of weight-bearing activity, strengthening, you know, calcium, protein, things like that, you start to lose mineral content, you lose the density, and they become more fragile. And there are people that have had fractures without even falling. Uh, like their femurs will fracture just when they're walking. So that's a, that's a significant problem. As your bones lose mass, that's when you de develop your osteoporosis. And this is both men and women. Uh, I think we hear a lot about it more in women um, because of some of the hormonal changes as you go through menopause and things like that. But men also get osteoporosis. So I tend to think men are underdiagnosed with this, but I don't have any data on that. So 
Uh, and this can result, result in the dowager's hump, which is when you get a hump kind of below your neck, but upper top of your, between your shoulder blades, I guess. So uh, you also have cartilage loss. And, and cartilage is what provides cushions like for between bony parts. So on your knees, we have cartilage and it should be nice and springy and spongy and protect when you're jumping and running and things like that. But as we age, it doesn't absorb as much water. So with that less water, your bones are closer together. And then you can start to develop arthritic changes, stress, painful, painful parts. Um, you can start to have um, like uh, femoral changes on your bones, things like that. So your ligaments uh, and connective tissues become less elastic. You know, you know, when kids fall and they just kind of bounce right back up, we don't all bounce like we used to. So, um, you know, you're supposed to have nice recoil with those, but they, again, get stiff and less elastic. So, And then we all know joint motions become more restricted and fle inflexible as you, decrease, as you age. So, you know, if you've sat too long, you have to maybe stand up and let your hip catch up to you, things like that, because some of those joints just tend to shorten and stiffen up real quick. What other things cause these changes? Well, if you're flex forward and letting, you know, collapsing into gravity, it's gonna lead to problems being in that position for a long time. So you tend to get stretched out in your neck, your trunk, and all those hip muscles like your hamstrings, glutes that are in the, their extensors, which means like they, you know, they extend. Um, they're chronically on stretch, so they're not supposed to be that way. Um, if you're sitting in a recliner a lot or in a wheelchair, I tell people you're starting to look kind of like a chair um, because you've <laughs> sat too much. And I think we've seen a lot of this the last couple of years with the pandemic. Um, unfortunately, I think we, I mean, we didn't really know what to do. So we told people to like, you know, shelter in place, which I think meant to people, don't do anything. Well, now we're seeing the repercussions of that. And unfortunately, it's we're meant to move. Movement's medicine. So hopefully none of us live through a pandemic again. But, <laughs> um, you know, movement is important. And I've just had so many patients the last couple of years that are like, I have never sat this much in my life. And it's led to lots of problems. So... Uh, how are we sleeping? Are you always putting a pillow under your knees? Because darn it, that feels really nice. But you know what? If your knee is always bent, it starts to stay bent. And you almost, or some patients get to where they can't get their leg straight anymore. And that interferes with walking, your balance, posture, all those things. Do you have too many pillows under your neck or none at all? Um, you really don't want your neck you know, really flexed one way or another. And, and I'll show you a picture later on of kind of how we'd like you to be. But um, some people, you know, they've had a surgery and now they've slept in a recliner and now they've kind of stayed there and have never made their way back to their bed. Well, I tend to think that leads to stiffness and pain and things like that. So uh, we talked about lack of activity. And then if you have to use something to walk, um, is it fit well for you? A lot of times people come in and their walker, it's usually they're too low. Um, their walker or their cane are too low. So we need to make sure it's adjusted for you. Um, or you've, you've borrowed this from a friend. Well, I bet you're not the same height. We need to adjust it. And I'll talk about that in a little bit too. too. So forward head position. Um, I see this a lot and not just elderly people. Um, I think having handheld devices, iPads, books tend to lean, lead to forward heads. Um, I have kids. I'm, you know, I need to show them some of these pictures because <laughs> they also will have forward head posture if we don't work on this. So uh, what happens when you have a forward head? Well, one of the first things is how you look around your world. Um, if your head is so much forward, it's really hard to look up. 
it's really hard to see what's in front of you if your head is so far forward in front of your body, you might not see what's coming. Um, with that, it changes how you're loading your vertebral spine, um, and it's kind of a slippery slope, can lead to this big word we call spondylosis, or we just sometimes say spondy because it's easier. Um, but you'll see compression fractures. We'll start to see arthritic changes, um, lots of pain, stiffness. You know, people come in and they're like, I can't turn my head to back out of my driveway. You know, anyone ever had that where they're like, I'm, I'm stuck. Um, and some of that's, you know, if you have a forward head, you're kind of closing down parts of that ver vertebral spine and it's not how your spine's meant to be. So I don't know what that was, but call it good. Um, research has shown that people with spondylosis definitely have instability signs, um, greater risk for falls. They don't react to their environment like they should. So, you know, lots of times people are like, what's, why are you, why do you care about my forward head? Well, it can lead to a lot of issues. Um, and I think I kind of touched on just how, how it affects you getting around in your environment. Um, maybe you don't see that curb that's right in front of you, um, or you're walking on a sidewalk and you don't see it's uneven or there's a stick or even in your house, if there's obstacles, hopefully not too many, but, um, you know, you might not see that and trip on them. So, and when you have decreased spinal mobility and flexibility, it, it interferes with how your body can easily, when you don't have those problems, easily correct for you get off balance, you can pull yourself back in. But if you're already starting with your head really far in front, you may have to almost overcorrect so you don't fall down. Um, so it's, again, you think it's minor, but it can lead to lots of falls, fractures, things like that. So um, this is just a, a nice picture, decent picture showing kind of the top ones, what we like to see. We like to see real thick vertebrae, vertebral bones, and then your disc in between looks should be nice and squishy. We don't want the vertebrae where your bones are almost touching. Um, the yellow is the nerve. We want space for those, those nerves to come out between the vertebrae because otherwise you're going to have a lot of nerve pain down your arms or your legs where when you get spondylosis, which is, there's a lot of technical words, but um, when your vertebrae, you know, should be stacked, if one's moving forward on another or one's moving back on another, which whichever way you like to look at it, it causes a lot of problems. Um, you can see you might have a bulging disc, which a lot of the material's squishing out away from the bone and not protecting between the vertebrae. Uh, you might start laying down extra bone, which I always think is kind of ironic that our bone, our body's protective mechanism is to put down extra bone, which then leads to spurs, which leads to more problems. But I don't know. I have lots of questions as to why we do that, but I don't know if we know. Uh, and then you can see kind of on the, the very, very bottom, um, it's trying to show where like the disc is pretty much squished out and then you don't really have room for nerves to glide and move like they should. And that's when we see a lot of burning pain, sharp pain, stabbing pain down upper or lower extremity or limbs. So other causes, uh, muscle weakness, just in general weakness. Um, we don't tend to work our neck muscles a lot so they can get weak. Uh, some people have had some other neurological insult. Uh, you might have been diagnosed with Parkinson's, which uh, just leads to more falls in general because you tend to have a shuffling gait or you get frozen um, or you've had a stroke. So when you have one, you might have one side that's greatly affected, that throws off your balance a lot. When you don't have, maybe you don't have use of your arm, so you can't throw that out to, you know, give yourself stability or your leg, you can't, it might give way on you. So that greatly affects how you react to your environment. And then a lot of musculoskeletal. So that's your hip and knee arthritis, your ankle arthritis, even feet. Um, I'm kind of a foot person, so I see a lot of foot issues. Um, and when you, you don't have those parts working well, again, 
It'll affect your, your posture, which could lead to falls. Spine. So just in general, we're, now we're kind of looking a little bit lower than your neck. Uh, a lot of people might have had a scoliosis for years and that they've kind of managed it. And then when you start to flex forward and collapse, uh, we, we sometimes see a rapid progression of these scoliotic curves. Um, I don't love it when people come in and their rib cage is sitting, you know, in their pelvis. That's not good. You have decreased lung capacity, lung space, can lead to more, you know, issues like with pneumonia, RSV, some of those things. So again, people are like, it's just my spine. I'm like, well, it can lead, lead to issues. Um, when you have these scoliosis or these curves in your spine, tend to see really rounded shoulders um, and your shoulder blades, we really want them to sit on your rib cage nice and close to each other, but we tend to see them kind of start to slide around your rib cage. Uh, we start to see flexed at your flexed at your elbows, knees, and hips. And then we, we see a lot of these varus or valgus deformities, um, which really affect pretty much your lower lower half, hips, knees, and ankles. And a lot of these are chain, caused by changes in the articular surface. And I'll show you, here's a picture. Um, kind of that first picture is what we consider more normal. Um, and again, there's lots of variables in here. Um, I don't know what, if, I don't know if anyone's ever normal, but this is what we like to see. So if it's, if you have a varus deformity, which some people might call more bow-legged, um, it may not be what you think. Uh, it actually affects more in the inner part of your knee when it's a varus deformity. Uh, and it can really stress the inner or outer part of your ankle, depending on how you compensate for that. And then if you're valgus or more knock kneed, uh, that's where we see it actually opens up on the inner part of your knee, that joint actually has more gapping. And then you're, a lot of times people are bone on bone on the outside of their knee. Uh, a lot of times your hips kind of turn at different angles. So oftentimes we'll see, I'll see problems above or below the knee as well, depending on how your body's trying to compensate. So, I mean, if, if you know you're walking really bow-legged, your, your center of gravity and mass is just different. So your body has to learn how, how do I compensate and change and adjust for balance. And some people are good at compensating and sometimes we kind of forget to integrate that. All right, looking down a little bit further, um, I said I'm kind of a, a foot person. I really like, I treat a lot of runners and people with foot problems and things like that. And I'm big on footwear. And I think that it it's probably an industry we've needed to change for a long time. Um, I know we, we like to wear, maybe not all of us, but cute shoes. Um, cute shoes don't usually, they usually equal pain to me. <laughs> um, if your shoe is looking like a triangle in the front, do you think your foot naturally looks like a triangle in the front? It, it shouldn't. Um, or, you know, high heels. I have had people where they've worn heels for 30 years and now they, they can't wear a regular shoe. They have to have some sort of lift. Um, cowboy boots, same thing, where you've had your heel lifted for so many years that your heel will no longer touch the ground if I'm trying to get it down there. Um, so I, I like people, I mean, and you, if you really feeling, you know, up to it today. You could take your shoes and socks off. Um, can you spread your toes? And that's kind of what I first start with people. And so many people, their toes are underneath other toes. They don't really look like a foot. Your foot doesn't look like a foot anymore. So maybe if you don't want to take your shoes and socks off today, because <laughs> I coach cross country in the fall and the kids, I, I made them do a tiny bit of barefoot running and I, I made them do this and they're like, I, what? I'm going to take my shoes and socks off? They thought, I, they looked at me like I was super weird. I don't think it's that weird. But I don't want you to lose the ability to splay, spread your toes. Um, can you keep your four toes down and can you lift just your big toe up? I'd like to know how many of you, you can report back to me. How many of you can do that? Um, because I think we've stuffed our feet in shoes for so long that 
your foot loses its, you have a lot of small muscles in your feet and you really lose the ability to, to use those. So um, I prefer shoes that have like a wide toe box, um, you know, uh, things that let you move your feet and your toes. So now, of course, if you have plantar fasciitis, um, you know, painful bunions, things like that, I'm not saying go around and walk, walk barefoot all the time. But I think doing some feet exercises are important. So, okay, I guess I'll stop on my foot, foot thing. But um, extra body weight, that just puts a lot of stress on the, those ankle joints. So try to keep your body weight in check. What was the nature of your job? Uh, we treat a lot of nurses. Well, they're on their feet 12 hours a day on usually concrete. They have a lot of foot problems, and it just kind of comes with the job, unfortunately. So, um, you know, wear good footwear. If you can roll up your shoe, like for, I don't know, five years ago, the ballet slippers were really in style, was really not much of a shoe. Um, and I couldn't believe the amount of people I'd see walking around Mary Greeley wearing that. And I'm, wow, I, I don't know. I just, I, my feet would not appreciate that all day long. So, you know, wear a wear the appropriate shoe for what you're doing, I guess. Um, and then your physical activity level. It's, it's good to do physical activity, but if you're doing too much, sometimes we have problems on one end, but if you're not doing enough, then we, you know, so you got to find that balance. Um, or I find, you know, people go skiing in the winter and you stuff your feet in ski boots. Well, if you do that for four or five days in a row and you come back, again, your feet are kind of crunched and you might have some problems. So, um, or even cycling shoes. Like if you go do that, take your feet out and then, you know, can you put your fingers between your toes and can you get that space in there? Um, I'm a big believer in toe spacers. So they're just little squishy, squishy things you put between your feet and I wear them around my house because I'm a nerd and like <laughs> I am. So um, other foot problems, hang on. Um, people that have had foot problems, the amount of falls that they report is, is significantly higher than those who have no foot problems. Um, and we're talking, you know, it could be anything. It could be a, a bunion. It could be fallen arches to plantar fasciitis. But all of those things factor into it being an increase for a risk for falling. Um, when we talk about feet, we talk about pronated and supinated feet and Sometimes in the running community, we say pronation's bad or supination's bad. Um, really, they're not bad if you, if you don't stay there. So when you land or when you're walking, if you're walking, you're really like the heel, toe, gait pattern. So heel, toe. And when you land, you kind of land, you should land on the outside of your foot, roll into the inside, and then come back out of it. If you stay in one of those positions, then we don't like that as much. So if you're pronated, pronated or you stay in pronation where you're kind of collapsing down or your arch is gone and you're on the inside of your foot, um, that foot type tends to have a higher risk of falls or you, you don't have as good a balance, especially if you're on one leg. That's what unilateral, like one leg balance or say you're trying to reach for something high, your balance is not nearly as good. The converse of that is if you have supinated feet where you're on the outside of your foot all the time, you, you're not able to correct for just different, different postural controls. So I like people to have what I call like the, the tripod stance. Like if you're in stance, we really want your big toe down, pinky toe, and your heel. So you have three points of contact. And a lot of people tend to stand on the outside of their feet. You might have just two points of contact. Um, so really making that good contact so your body knows where you're at in space. Sometimes we'll see differences in mu muscle activities, um, which might be a compensation, um, a neuromuscular compensation, um, to try to decrease some of, like there's a lot of different arches in your foot, um, but trying to decrease how much you're using, like the, the arch that goes across your foot. So this might be, Sometimes we'll see this with more neurological conditions um, like Parkinson's again, or maybe even Alzheimer's where you're not getting maybe the correct signal from your foot all the way to your brain. So things just change and there's not a lot you can do about it if you're not 
actively working on it. So, And a lot of these differences lead to other problems, such as muscular fatigue, which, again, you know, say you're going for a long walk, you might be fine at first, and then by the time, you know, you're like, oh, my gosh, I still have 10 blocks till home, you might really start to see I'm not, man, I'm not picking my foot up, I'm stumbling, and I'm not able to correct. So slippery slope. <laughs> this picture makes me laugh. Does anyone sleep like that? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> um, did someone say yeah? Uh-oh. <laughs> we'll have to talk. Um, external causes of change. Some of these things, there's, you know, you have a major car accident, you have major fractures. There's nothing, you know, it takes a long time to come back from some of those things. And maybe you, you do want to sleep like this. Maybe that's the only place you can sleep or it's comfortable. Um, but it's probably going to lead to issues further down the road. So, um, and kind of in that same thing with trauma are falls where, you know, maybe you've had a really bad fall and we call it fear avoidance. Well, then you start avoiding doing things and you start kind of closing in and you don't challenge your balance system, which then again, if you, I always say, if you don't use it, you lose it. And it's, it's true. You really, you need to work on balance throughout your lifetime. Otherwise you will not it'll be gone and you won't be able to stand on one leg and that's not great. So lifestyle, sedentary. Yeah, we don't like people being sedentary. Desk work. Uh, are you at a desk a lot? Um, I'm hoping most of you guys are retired, but I find a lot of my retirees still sit at a desk for a long time. There are people who do genealogy and they sat there for eight hours that day. Um, do you have a good workstation? You know, do you, are your feet flat on the floor? Like I'm pretty short, so many chairs, you know, my toes are dangling. Well, then you arch your back. Um, do you use your armrests? You don't want to lean on them, but you just kind of want to rest your arms there. Um, is your computer screen level with your eyes or is it too high? And then you're cranking on your neck again. Um, and even if you're sitting for, if people are sitting less than an hour, I'll, I'll be okay with that. But really, after 45 minutes, I like people to get up, walk around a little bit. Um, we're not meant to sit for hours and hours. Kind of the same thing with car rides. Um, if you're taking a long car ride, drink lots of water, so you have to go to the bathroom a lot. Get out. Go. Um, and then our habits. Sleeping, po sleeping positions. Um, you know, sitting on your favorite spot on the couch. I feel like everyone kind of has their chair, but do you always curl up on one side? Um, you know, or people tell me, I can't sleep on my left side. Why not? Um, I hope you can sleep on both sides. Um, oh, there was somewhere else I was going with that. Oh, do you, can you cross both legs? I have a lot of people that say, I can only cross my right over my left, but not the other way around. Um, anyone like that? <laughs> Well, and to say that, I mean, you could just cross at the ankle and then you don't have to worry about it. But um, a lot of times we get where we kind of become lopsided. So, um, and again, it happens before you even notice. So, and then there's the wearing the high heels thing. So, so who cares? Well, I think, I think we've addressed why we care, but it definitely affects balance, mobility, um, you I don't want to see people falling. Uh, there's lots of research out there. I think it's over age 70, if you, maybe it's 75. If you fall and break a hip, like life, inspect, life expectancy decreases. So it's, we do not want to see falls. It's, it's important to not fall. We start to see people limiting their social interactions because they are afraid to go out. And I get it, like last week when it was icy, stay in, <laughs> it's not worth it. Um, yeah, yeah, and kind of every Thursday for the last three weeks, you can stay in, it's fine. <laughs> but um, we don't want that forever. You know, we want, we're, we're social creatures. You need to be in community. Um, and when people start to worry about, I don't know if I can make it from the car into the restaurant, they start limiting themselves. And that's when I get worried. Um, we, don't, we don't want that. There's the breathing. When you're starting to get into that collapsed position, you're closing down your lungs, like I said before, which leads to a whole lot of other things. Pain. Pain's, I mean, that's probably the number one thing people come into us for is pain. Um, so it, it greatly affects many, many structures. And then we have lots of weakened muscles. And we tend to find that 
your quad, which is, uh, I don't know where I go, muscle on the front quads and your calves, um, those muscles tend to be more atrophied or they shrink and get smaller with um, more than some of your other postural muscles. And I think most of our exercise classes are pretty good about hitting like quads and things, but we tend to forget about our calves a lot, which are really one of your biggest propellers when you're walking. Um, so I'm, I'm big on calf strengthening as well. So, so aging, uh, it, it affects all your daily life activities. Um, and it can reduce your willingness to do things, can reduce your health. It doesn't have to, but a lot of times, I mean, it's, I don't think it's easy to age probably. <laughs> so no one's ever come in and said, this is great. I love it. So we'll, we'll see. Um, it increases, I think, I find people are a lot more sedentary. Um, you know, you don't have to get up every day and get out the door at a certain time. So maybe, you know, and then not everyone. I, I know people who are more busy, retired than they were before, they tell me. So, but it, it, and it can compromise your quality of life. And, you know, I, I want people to age as well as possible. So I don't want to see, see that. And then we have a lot of those physiological changes. So, muscle length, um, like we talked about the Achilles shortening, which goes along with your calf muscle shortening. Um, muscle strength, it, it can decrease dra dramatically, but there's a lot of studies out there when, when you've seen, I don't know if you've seen some of those shows or things where some of the elderly people have really committed to strength training three times a week. It's, it's impressive. Like they can still lift a lot. Um, I hope I can be like that someday. Um, and it reduces your flexibility and agility. Um, so it can, it can hit a lot of areas. And then there's three systems that we hadn't, haven't really talked yet, but they really, all three of these integrate very well to control your balance and in, in body um, where you're at, again, with in space and without, you know, for your balance. So it's really your vision, your vestibular system, which is, semicircular canals in your inner ear, and then your somatosensory of like kind of what you, you feel and your inputs from your feet on up to your brain. Uh, and I don't know if any of you have ever had like a vestibular issue or, you know, um, oh, what's it called? Well, you get, you get the dizzies or the spins. Vertigo. It, vertigo, that, yes. That was just a test. No, I'm just kidding. I forgot. Um, it, it affects your balance greatly. Um, I actually, like 10 years ago, I woke up and I tried to stand up and I couldn't. And I had to like crawl to, to get the kids up. And we have a vestibular specialist. My husband had to drive me. Um, and she, there's different maneuvers you do, but like my world was spinning and moving. Um, so that was a pretty severe case, which it can last for a while. And, and there's people that have it kind of regularly. Um, but if all three of these are not working together, you will not be able to navigate and keep your balance. Um, when people come in and I check their balance, you might look great standing on one leg. You might look good when I put you in tandem, like one foot in front of the other, or like you're walking a tightrope. And then I ask you to close your eyes. And then, then it gets really fun. Um, people start to sway and move. And, you know, so just closing your eyes can make a big difference. So, um, which is what we see when people fall at night. It's dark. You know, you've taken one of your systems out. So, um, it's important to uh, keep all three of those working well together if, po if possible. So, so, what can you do? There's lots of things. Um, exercise is probably the number one, number one or two thing, I, I think. Getting your cardiovascular exercise in, whether it's just, you know, today's gorgeous out. I hope you can go take advantage of that. Walking. Um, now with biking, we have so many other styles of bikes. So if you do have a balance problem, now they have kind of like the trikes and things that are lower to the ground. So I, I'm not worried about someone trying to get on and off a bike as much as I used to. Um, strength training critical for bone mass, for muscle mass, things like that. So if you can, you know, take advantage of uh, silver sneakers or, you know, any of the classes around that kind of cater to people that are not 20 something um, and don't even ever hurt and can do anything, 
do those classes. So, um, and then stretching. It's very, you know, sometimes we forget about stretching, but um, especially ankles, hips, knees, we want to keep those mobile. So, positioning, and I'll I'll show a couple of pictures here in a minute of kind of how we like like positioning. Diet. Um, I think this is another area in the U.S. we just <laughs> don't do very well at with Western medicine. Um, Fresh fruit and vegetables, very important. Um, you know, getting good food in and not trying to, and it probably gets old fixing meals over and over and over. Um, but, you know, healthy food is very important and can really help help a lot of issues. And then, you know, ask, ask for help from your medical professionals. Um, we all want to help and try to try to get you back on track if there's something that's missing or you need help with. So here's just a couple pictures for uh, proper sleeping positions. If you like to sleep on your back, um, usually we like something under your neck because you have a little bit of a curve there or you should. So that's just a cervical roll. It should be kind of squishy, spongy. Um, we usually just now tell people to order them on Amazon because they're cheaper than through us because everything through medical is marked up like two times. So. Um, or if you're on your side, we don't want your neck really flexed one way or the other. So when you're on your side, we really like your spine to be as level as possible. So including the neck all the way through your back. And then also if you're on your side, the same thing for your hips and your knees. We, if your knee is really a lot lower than your hip, it really can pull on your spine and your kind of where your spine meets your pelvis. So Generally, one pillow is is enough, um, unless you're in our clinic and our pillows are a little old, they look more like crepes. So they're not super fluffy anymore, we might do two. But if you have a brand new fluffy pillow, one's probably good. Um, but that, you know, hopefully you're sleeping maybe eight hours. Um, if you're there for a long time, you need you need some support. And and it's it's not easy to change sleeping posture. Um, you know, even if you start here, that's better than none at all. So I'll tell people, start with the pillow. You might lose it in the night. You might turn over and you're just tired of it. You toss it, but, but try it. So, and then here's where we're talking about poorly fitting assistive, assistive devices. So the picture with the red X, the gentleman's pretty far out of his walker and he's really flexed forward. His handles are really low. Just being that far away from his walker already sets him up for falling. Um, he's he's too far away from it and he's stooped, so he's not doing any of the posterior chain, all the back, all the way from his hamstrings. He's not doing that any favor. So we would raise it up for that person. Want them? We want him closer in the walker, and then you can see he's much more upright and a lot more safe there. Um, so fitting a cane or a walker, um, you can flip the cane upside down or you can, you can leave it right side up either way. But, um, oftentimes we find they're, yeah, usually too low, but if you're just standing, you want your arms right at your side, you don't, you're not trying to grab the cane. When your arm's at your side, the cane should just come to your bone on your wrist. So, um, again, you're not grabbing it, your, your arm's just resting at your side. Um, it's kind of the, the walker, you should have like a little bit of bend in your elbow. It shouldn't, you shouldn't be straight because that'll tend to put your shoulders in your ears. But um, again, you don't, you don't want it too low where you're flex forward and stooping. So, and hopefully if you get one of these, you'll be fit appropriately. But once in a while we find that you're not. So, yes. That one's too long. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Actually, that's a very good question. Yeah. Sorry. I'm glad you asked that. Yeah. So the wrist bone, that's where it should stop. Yep. Yeah. That clarify that? Okay. Good. Okay. So I'm just going to give you a few exercises here. Always we have to kind of disclose if you have pain, if you have pain doing them, please stop. Um, you know, ask ask us, get in to see a PT or something like that. If, you know, some, if you're like, something's 
definitely wrong. Don't don't continue doing it. So, so we'll start with some of the low hanging fruit first because we can all do this right now. Um, chin tucks. These, you know, lots of times people come in and they tell me I hate exercise, which is just I, I have a hard time with that because I like exercise a lot, um, or I don't have time for exercise. I don't really believe that. <laughs> I think we all have probably. 20 minutes at least a day that you could probably do something. So, and chin tucks you can do throughout the day. So, really here, the first picture, you kind of see how her ear is in front of her shoulder. So, you can just put two or three fingers on your chin. Um, you can do this seated or standing, and you're just going to gently press back and make a double chin. That's fine. Um, it, won't, it won't hurt your your chin look, um, I promise. <laughs> Pull it back, and then you're gonna hold for 15 to 20 seconds. Um, if you can, you might feel it kind of tight in here, or it might even, sometimes people will feel it stretch back here. But we tend to not use our deep neck flexors very much. And you can just do three of these at a time. So it's nothing, not asking for a huge time commitment, but it's just a small chin tuck. So you tuck and hold. And it's really, especially you can do this if you are at your computer, you're reading on a Kindle or something, stop for a while, change your position because people tend to be like this for so long that these muscles get really short. So, or if you're on your phone, yeah, or just get a real book. <laughs> <laughs> do you guys still like real books? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Me too. Yeah. Um, another one. Probably most of you have had PT at one or another time, probably have bands around the house. Um, if not, impressive, but um, this is just, you can take a band, you can do it in standing or sitting again. You can do it with your arms up where you're just pulling your hands apart. Um, and actually this picture, his palms are down. I actually prefer thumbs up. Um, just because when you turn your thumb up, that actually gives you just a little bit more sh room in your shoulder, especially, I, when you get to 90 degrees and above, I prefer people's thumbs to be up. So if you're going to be up here, thumb up, and then you're pulling. So your shoulder blades should be kind of coming together when you do that. You could also do that at your side with your elbows bent, um, which is actually a really good rotator cuff exercise where you're just keeping your elbows in. You're not going out, going out to the side this way. You really should feel it kind of shoulder blade, bottom of your shoulder blade working some of those postural muscles around your shoulder blade. Um, we tend to find uh, rotator cuff tends to get, uh, dege it does degenerate with age, spurs, things like that. So again, a lot of people aren't doing rotation exercises that we, we really want you to do um, for, for your rotator cuff. So um, on here, it says repeat two times 10. I usually have people start with just 10 um, for a day or two to make sure you're okay with it. And then, then you can do two sets of 10. But some people come back and are like, I was sore for four days. Like, oh, maybe a little too much. So ease in. Uh, next one is bird dog. Um, our hands and knees is actually a really good position to unweight your spine. Now, make sure you can get off the floor. Um, <laughs> if you can't, don't get down there. And then uh, what am I going to do now? Uh, I have had people do it on their bed as long as it's not where you're going to fall off your bed and hurt yourself. Um, sometimes a couch, maybe. Um, and if you can't get off and on the floor, you should probably come see us because we'll help you learn how to do that safely. Um, so you get on hands and knees. We really want your wrists underneath your shoulders. And oftentimes I'll even just use this as like a, a spinal deloading if you're having spinal pain, kind of takes away that pain. Um, and then you can also draw in your abdominals for like a core core exercise. And when I say that, it's not just a <gasps> sucking in and holding my breath. Um, that's really just holding your breath. Um, you really want to use the muscles around your, your front and back. Like they work together like a corset and they should kind of come together. Um, and most people just really want to bear down and hold their breath. So if you're your, if your belly's bulging out or you find you're, I can't even talk, you're probably not doing it how I would like you to do it. So <laughs> so that's kind of maybe a starting point in and of itself. If you're like, yeah, I'm a pro, I got that piece of cake, 
Then you can start with either just an arm raise, just a leg raise, or the bird dog is opposite arm, opposite leg, which is a, it's, it's a balance exercise. You have to learn to control so you don't fall over because you only have two points of contact. So, um, and you can just slowly raise, come back down. You can do all one side at first and then alternate, or you can alternate sides. I'm not picky on that stuff. So, and again, I'll usually have people do 10 and then, and you can either do 10 on each side or five on each side for a total of 10, depending on just how, you know, you kind of know how much time you need to take with exercises. So another key point is with your head, you don't want to really, a lot of people tend to like look up really high. I, I kind of have people just kind of gaze out in front of them and at the ground. So you're not, again, cranking on your head one way or another. Uh, doorway stretch. Most of us should have doorways, I would think, where you live. Um, so this is, again, another low-hanging fruit. Um, and again, you can do this one throughout the day. You just find a door. Now, this person has their arms up really high. If, if it bothers you to get your arms up that high, you do not need to. Um, you can bring them down lower or closer to your body, and then you lean into the, the door. And again, you want to hold for 15 to 20 seconds and then back out and do that three times. Spinal decompression. Again, if you've had a lot of spinal spine pain, um, just a lot of degeneration, you can grab on a kitchen sink, lean back, um, make sure you have like shoes or grippy socks on so you don't slip. We do not want falls. You know that's not good. And then you wanna hold that for 20 to 30 seconds. And this is where I really like people to even take some deep breaths or what I call box breathing, where you inhale for four seconds, Hold for four seconds, exhale for four seconds, continue. So it's, it's kind of like you're making a box, but it's working on lung capacity control. So again, maybe you have something waiting for the water to boil, never boils because you're watching it, do spinal decompression, <laughs> then you'll be good. And then the last one, um, I, I like this exercise a lot because it hits a lot of different muscle groups. Um, and again, you don't have to do it on the floor, but be careful wherever you do it. Um, this is where I, I like people to draw in their abdominal muscles again, and you're not holding your breath. I'll oftentimes tell people to kind of belly button in or towards the table, um, and then lift. Um, this is kind of the easiest position where your arms are down. If that's too easy, you can just have elbows down. If that's too easy, you can cross your arms across your chest. Um, this person's going pretty high. Uh, if you have neck problems, I would be careful. I wouldn't go that high. So, and again, you might just be starting where you're just trying to clear your, your buns off the floor wherever you're at. So again, kind of see where you're at with that. I think that was it. That's it. So. Okay, now is our opportunity to ask any questions. We'll check with Tim first to see if he has any in the chat. Does anybody have questions in person here? We'll start with Bob. Actually, I have two questions. Okay. Uh -oh. uh, two questions, uh, sciatica and uh, performance muscle uh, issues. Um, is that a structural, postural issue, or is it a degenerative kind of issue. Sciatica? Uh, sciatica and, and performance muscle issues. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say it's somewhat of a degeneration and it can lead to some postural issues because if, you're, if your nerve is really compressed, sometimes you're not getting the signal to your muscles to hold you up. Um, so sometimes I'll see a lot of like my legs giving way. Well, that's a fall risk. Um, that's a problem. Yeah. Lumbar support. Tell me a little bit more. Oh, obviously the cars have some kinds of lumbar support. Do you want to go all the way up to, uh, to a lot of support or is it too, that too much? Mm -hmm. Like you're talking about like a back brace. Um, the research is kind of funny on braces. It, I'm talking about that, that lumbar support that goes up and down on the car seat. Oh, on the car. Sorry, I missed that whole, missed that hard part. 
Yes. Actually, I if you can adjust it where you feel like it's supporting your low back and the car, I like them. Um, again, like I'm short, so it hits me at the wrong spot. Um, where if we're taking a long car ride, I actually have just a little lumbar roll I'll stick in there so I can get it to, to me. But if, if you have like a fancy car and you can do all the cool adjustments, I would do it. Yeah, yeah. I'll have a fancy car someday. <laughs> My question is for proper sleeping position on your side. And I thought you said when you are on your side to have your legs straight. But in the diagram and when you were talking, it sounds like you've got the legs bent. If I said on your side, legs straight, I didn't, you do not have to have your legs all the way straight out. You can, like, you can have them bent. Um, generally, if people are really crunched up, like completely almost reversing their curve too far. Sometimes that causes problems, but more just like the picture where it's like a, a gentle gentle knee bend. That's how we prefer on your side. I don't, I'm not sure if, did I say laying on your side, you should have your legs straight? Because I didn't mean to say that. If I did, sorry. I could have misunderstood you. Okay. So you said when we shut our eyes, who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> Yeah. So, oh, I should have um, said, don't do that without <laughs> having something to hang on to. Don't try it on your own. So um, th is that part of the soma soma sensory? Is Actually, that's visual. That's, okay. that's visual. Eyes open, eyes closed is visual. Somatosensory is really like standing on a level surface. Can you do that with your feet apart? Can you do that with your feet together? Okay. Um, then I might put you on a pillow or a foam surface. Okay. How do you adjust, or grass, hills? So okay. your body adjusting to whatever surface you're on, um, that's more somatosensory. It's, it's really what your sensory organs are feeling and traveling up to your brain to tell you, oh, I'm going up a hill, or I'm, this is really hard, icy surface, you know, things like that. Yeah. So how good should should we be when we're when our eyes are shut as far as balance? I mean, what? <laughs> yes, yeah. That was that was I guess. Yes, I guess I and yeah, questions. that's actually a really good question. I didn't kind of I didn't tell you some of the things we look for. Um, and again, don't try this if you don't have someone around you, or you know, I I don't want a bunch of falls next week, so that's not the goal. Um, when we, we have like a whole fall and balance screen, and we, I mean, we go through a whole lot of things, but some of the simpler tests are like, can you stand on one leg for longer than 10 seconds? And first with your eyes open, and then we'll check with your eyes closed. Um, we'll do a test where we do 10 times of stand up, sit down, and I time you and see how fast you can do that. Um, so that's checking strength, balance, agility, you know, a lot of things. Um, and we actually have normatives for that. And we kind of see where you fall in, into that category. Um, really, most people with their feet apart, and if you close your eyes, you, you might have like a little bit of, like we call this sway. You might have a little sway, but you should not be like, whoa, I'm, you know, I'm on a boat. Shouldn't, shouldn't be like that kind of thing. Yeah, so it's... There's kind of a lot to it, but there are a few simple things we start with and then we make it harder and harder as we test you. <laughs> yeah, but usually the easiest one is, can you stand on one leg? And it's kind of surprising how many people can't actually. Yeah, but again, hang on to something, be careful. So when you were talking about foot problems, you made a quick reference about when you're walking, you want the heel to hit first and then toward the toe. And you made some comment about the outside of the foot and then the inside, but you did a real quick pass on that. So could you run that by slowly for us? Sure, of course. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I, I love gait analysis, walking, running analysis. So when you are walking, generally we consider it normal or good. If you hit on your heel, you roll to the outside of your foot a little bit, and then you roll to the inside of your foot. And you kind of hit, roll, hit, roll. You should not hit, stay on the outside of your foot, which is supination. We don't want to keep see you stay there. We don't want to see you hit and just collapse in on the inner part of your foot. Um, we like to see kind of that you go through that whole pattern or that whole motion. 
Um, now, there are, you know, you watch anyone walk or you, you go to the Iowa State Fair and you'll see a thousand different gait patterns um, with a lot of other stuff, but I don't get in that. Um, but there are, you know, everyone's a little bit different, but I get concerned when I see people, people walking only on their toes. Um, there's usually either shortened Achilles, is there a neurological component, things like that. So now running's a whole different beast and I didn't, I'd come back and do a running talk any day, but <laughs> um, that, that gait pattern's different. So, um, but I'm just talking about walking with that. Yeah, does that kind of help clarify that? Okay, I think this is a pretty short one, but uh, as we, you said, as we get older, we don't absorb as much water, uh, speaking like of the, the discs yes. between the vertebrae and things like that. Uh, why don't we and how can you uh, get more? If I knew the answer to that, I probably wouldn't be speaking here. <laughs> I, d I wish I knew, like, I, I think it's, it bothers me too. Like, why do we lose bone mass so early? Why do we not, why are we not able to absorb water? I don't know if it's, I mean, I don't think we, no one really has a good answer for that. I do know in the morning when you wake up, you actually, you are taller than you are throughout. You kind of decom, you know, especially if you're on your feet all day. But I think it's part of that aging process where you just don't absorb things like you should, but that that might not be a good answer. I don't. I really don't know know the answer to that. Because we start drinking uh, coffee and things like that. <laughs> well, we do lose a lot of our thirst mechanism. Like a lot of people tell me they're not thirsty, and they do find that people kind of lose that signal. Like I am super thirsty, um, so we don't drink as much as we should. Um, sometimes people have incontinence and they don't want to have that, so they don't want to get up and go. They don't want to have to get up in the night another time. Um, I think there's probably a lot of factors, but I don't, I don't know if I have a great, just one solid answer to that. But yeah. Do you have a recommendation for a good walking shoe for those of us who do have flat feet and overpronate? Mm -hmm. um, well, one, I don't think there's one shoe that fits everybody. Um, first of all, it should feel comfortable. Like it shouldn't be where I have to break this in. Um, it should feel good the first time. Walk around in the shoe store with it on. Um, hmm? Why? Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, I, I do not believe that. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe if it's leather, but eh, yeah, I, um, it, I like several different kinds of shoes for different things. Now, Altra's, A-L-T-R-A, um, I like them because they don't have a huge, they don't have a big heel drop, which is from the heel to the front. Um, but they don't necessarily, some of them do not have a lot of cushioning. So if you have flat feet, some people like a shoe with more support, like an Asics or a New Balance or something like that. Some people like the hokas for cushioning, but I tend to find some of them are so cushiony, they actually cause more balance problems. I've, I've seen people actually more falls. Again, I don't have a scientific research project going on that, but like, I don't think hokas are for everybody. Now, if you have plantar fasciitis, some people love the hokas because they do give you more cushion. Um, so it depends on where you're walking to. Do you want a trail shoe with more grip so you're not you know, slipping, sliding. Um, Nike makes a trail shoe. Ultra makes a trail shoe. Um, Merrill, Merrill's actually pretty good. Um, but it has to, you have to try it on, it has to feel good. Um, and have you had flat feet since you were born or have they just? Pretty much. So. Pretty much, yeah, okay. Now, some people have pain with flat feet and some people don't. So some um, orthopedic, Doctors don't love me when I say, if you've been an orthotic forever, like, have you done any foot exercises? Have you done anything to strengthen? Um, because we don't give someone crutches and tell them to use it for the rest of their life. Um, I kind of feel the same way about orthotics, um, except flat feet's a little bit of an exception if, if you were born that way. Um, you probably need a little bit of something, so yeah. 
Well, this is totally a different type of question. Ooh. But my mother always threatened when I was in junior high and high school that she was going to get a brace on me because my back, I was so stoop-shouldered. Mm -hmm. And so I want to know if there's been any studies done because today's kids, we had to carry uh, our zippered notebooks and we were lean forward like this, and I had to walk a ways home. Today's kids have the backpacks that pull them back this way, so will they have less problems with back issues for a while, not as skidded as soon as we did, and theirs will be more in the neck from being on their smartphones and all of that stuff. Right. Yeah. I think that it, we could see two things. Um, kids' backpacks, the when they've weighed them, they've done studies with weighted kids. I mean, my own son's backpack, when it was the second year of COVID when he had to carry everything and couldn't go, like, his backpack weighed 45 pounds. Oh my God. And he biked to school. <laughs> and I was like, holy cow. And that was a lot. So might have been the other way. Um, I do tend to think, like, I, I don't know if anyone who's ever been to, like, a finishing school or where they used to do, people tell me they used to have posture classes. I I think that wasn't such a terrible idea. Um, just because we worked on it more, you know, we, it was kind of considered etiquette and part of all of that, which I, I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, so I think the jury's out on what we'll see, but I, I mean, definitely we see a lot more neck, you know, flexed forward posture that way. Um, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. So you guys didn't, you didn't have a backpack at all. You just carried everything in front. That was a zippered notebook. Oh. So you were round shouldered all the way home. Oh. No strap or anything on it? No. Oh. And uphill both ways? Yeah. Right. No no Mad. Yeah. See, I think that made you tougher and grittier personally. So how do I get an appointment with you? <laughs> Um, you can call our, um, I'm in Mary Greeley. We're different from Mary McFarland. 515-239-6770 um, will get you. We're kind of in the midst of a scheduling change. Um, we're kind of short of secretary. That will get you to central scheduling. Um, you might want to call 6771, which will actually get you to my office because we're, we're in the test phase it's not super smooth, so I don't know. <laughs> you can, sure, 515-239-6771 will actually should get you to our secretary who knows all of us therapists. I mean, most of us will all treat general, you know, back pain, posture correction, things like that. Now we have a person who's more does like vestibular, the neuro side. Brent and I tend to do more orthopedic, musculoskeletal. Um, Katie's like our women's health. So we kind of have our own niches that we do, but we, we're all trained PTs. So it kind of, you know, kind of depends, but. Well, if you're Medicare, which I would assume a lot of people probably are, um, just a guess, I don't know. Um, you have to have a doctor's referral for PT um, in Iowa. Even though we're direct access, you technically could come to us, but if you want insurance, a lot of times if you have a pretty good relationship with your doctor, you can ask them for a referral. Some of them like you to come in because, you know, a little bit more money. <laughs> That's how the world works. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I have a remark, too. Uh, 45 pounds, that's what wildfire fighters, that's the test for wildfire fighters if they can carry 45 pounds Is for really? three miles in 45 minutes. So your, your kids might be qualified. <laughs> I'll tell. I'll tell him. Yeah. Well, this is for a family member, and and but it, and it might be beyond what what the class is about. But you ever work with diabetic people and or people with charcoal foot? Mm -hmm. Yes, and, actually. Yeah, I was gonna say charcoal foot, but I didn't know if people would be like, "What in the world is that?" Um, but it comes along with di diabetics and. Um, 
you know, with a diabetic foot, there's diabetic shoes and socks and, and we, we do, um, you know, a lot of that depends on where they're at in the diagnosis. Um, you know, sometimes they get really bad and you're almost walking basically on the arch of your foot. Um, so it kind of depends on where they're at in that process as to what we can do for them. Um, sometimes they do need to go see um, like our podiatrist and actually have a custom shoe. Um, so it's kind of, it varies. Um, yeah, this person's waiting for a shark foot operation. I mean, it really so, turned up. Yeah. And say, and, once uh, it gets bad, it's pretty, it, it's so life altering. Ho- hoping that, that the operation is good enough the, the foot isn't gone when he's done. Exactly. No, that's uh, true. Yeah. Yeah. And and maybe there'd be follow-up things that would be helpful, you know, after a su- hopefully successful operation. Yes. I, I would agree with that. I tend to find, I guess I didn't mention that, but when people have foot surgeries or they, you know, they get stuck in a boot for 12 weeks, Probably one of my biggest pet peeve is when they're like, you're good. Take it off. See you later. Well, then you have so much atrophy and issues and either, you know, your, your joints stiff, your muscles are atrophied. You don't, your ankle range of motions poor. I am always, please advocate for yourself. Like I, I don't even know how to walk right anymore. You know, can I see PT for even a couple visits? Um, and most doctors are pretty darn good about that. But sometimes you have to ask. Um, I'm, I'm still surprised at how many, I mean, I love our doctors here, but they're like, you're good. I'm like, oh my gosh, you, you were non-weight bearing for 12 weeks. I usually don't expect you to just get up and walk around. So I would probably advocate for, I would hope they would do some sort of rehab after the surgery for sure. Yeah, yeah. I had another question about uh, foot exercise before walking. Hmm. Yes. Um, I usually just hang over and put my toes on the edge of the step and stretch my Achilles that way. Mm-hmm. Is that okay? And are there other things I should be doing? Yes. Um, so I think it, I hope you're on your bottom step, not your top. <laughs> okay. No, no falling from the top down. Um, yes, I like that where you have your toes on the edge of the step and like, are you just letting your heel drop or are you coming up on your toes as well? I usually let my heels drop and, you know, count to 20 or something. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes I go up and down a little bit. Yep. Okay. So you're getting more of the Achilles stretch, which is a good way to kind of get it to warm up. Um, I'm a big believer in calf raises. So you know, hang on to your rail, and then you can also do 10 to 20 heel raises. Um, Even off of your step, I like people to do um, actually bent knee heel raises. Hmm. Because um, if you do bent knee heel raises, you get the second part of your calf. You're getting your, um, not just your soleus, but your gastroc also, and most of us don't do that. So, um, and then you can even do single leg if your, you know, build up so that you don't have like a small micro tear or something if people start too aggressive. So, yeah. Okay, great. Tim, I'll just check in with you and see if we have any questions in our chat. Yes, we have one question. Is one sleeping position preferable to another? Okay. Um, I don't think that there's one preferable to another. I know a lot of people have CPAP, so they have to sleep on their back. Um, so you have to do it. Um, I don't love people sleeping on their stomach, actually. Um, it generally is really hard on your neck if you're cranked one way or another. But... If you have to be flat on your back or on your side, try to use pillows or a cervical support if needed. Thank you, Anne, for preparing this presentation for us today. We really appreciate it. 
I'll just remind everyone quickly of our upcoming programs. On Thursday, March 9th at 2 o'clock here in the auditorium, we'll have a program called Staying Independent, Independent and Knowing Your Options. Uh Next month, Wednesday, April 12th at 2 o'clock, we have Living with Vision Loss. And Thursday, April 27th, here in the auditorium again, Getting Your Ducks in Line. Once again, thank you for joining us today and have a wonderful day.